Welcome along to the Lifting and Life podcast. I'm Cam, I'm the host. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology. I'm a personal trainer and I also work in IT. Today, I'm joined by the one and only Hayden Wild. Hayden, as I'm sure you know, is a very well accomplished triathlete, including having got the bronze medal in the last Olympics in 2020. I'm fortunate enough to be mates with him and his brothers from Fakatane. Shout out to Mr. Hamish Wild there. In all seriousness, though, I honestly really enjoyed this episode. I haven't really had the chance to have a good catch up with Hayden over the years since he's um, been a triathlete and been accomplishing all the, the stuff that he's achieved. So I really enjoyed just being able to catch up with him. In terms of what we chatted about specifically, we started off by talking about where his career in triathlon started. We uh, actually had a bit of a running race back at school. He wouldn't consider it a race because he was so far ahead, but hey, that's all right. I, I was definitely a pivotal role in his triathlon career. I'm, I'm just kidding. Definitely wasn't. But yeah, we chatted about where he, his journey started. Then we um, went over some of the mental and physical challenges he's had to overcome throughout his journey. Then we talked about what it's like competing in the circuit over in Europe and being so far away from friends and family back home. And then, of course, we went over the comparisons, I suppose, between the last Olympics and the upcoming Olympics and how he's feeling, how they may be um, different or similar in terms of the course and the, the competition. So, yeah, we kind of touched on it all, I suppose. We, we really discussed a lot in this episode. As always, I appreciate you tuning into the podcast and any support you can show goes a long way and it helps me keep getting these awesome guests on. I hope you enjoy the episode. And remember, you make you. Anyway, Mr. Hayden Wild, should we get started? Thanks heaps for joining me today, bro. No, it's good to be here. I've uh, chatted to a few triathletes and stuff now, so it's nice to uh, get you on board. I actually chatted to Matt Hastings. So a couple of weeks ago and Hamish oh, messaged yeah. me saying, um, oh, small world, we're family friends from like Cambridge or something like that. Oh, man, ages ago, eh? like we used to play football with them and then like yeah. randomly he just came up to me in New Plymouth after the, like, the World Cup. He's like, Hayden. And I was like, oh, man, you look so familiar. And because we, we actually did a lot of stuff with his brother, Jared, uh, and oh, he was okay. a little bit older. And then uh, he's like, yeah, no, dude, getting like really into tries and stuff. And yeah, now he's doing like ultras and, and like the long distance stuff. I don't do the long distance stuff, but um, yeah, it was pretty crack up. Now he's just like really into it. But um, I think he's kind of really kind of veering into the ultra marathon side of thing. And then, yeah, Simon Cochran is just like, uh, yeah, he's a spastic. Bro, <laughs> In a good way. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next level. Because I saw Wait. you were, was it the Triathlon Awards a couple of weeks ago? And I, I saw he was there as well. I figured you guys Yeah, Yeah, well, he used to be coached by my coach. And then he just, I don't know, the stuff that he does, I just don't know how you coach that. Like, <laughs> like man, the, he does some crazy stuff, man. He's kudos to that guy. Yeah, He's doing like 24 like... hour races on the track. I'm like, what? I do like a, I try and attempt like the New Zealand hour record. And I'm just like, man, I've, I've done like Cooked. 30 laps on this thing and I'm just done. Yeah. Man, like that Ultraman stuff. I knew it was crazy, but the more I've been following him and diving deeper into that stuff, the more I'm just blown away by those yeah. kind well, of distances, like, man. Yeah. It's like, you know, I think anyone like, well, if you're a professional Ironman athlete, I feel like you could probably do like day on day out. Ironmans for sure, like just in training, but when you're actually doing it at a race effort, it's like it's a whole different ball game, you know. It's like, wow, yeah, yeah bugger, bugger that. Just the, I think it's the marathon that really just breaks you and breaks you apart, really. Yeah, that double marathon at the end, and he did it in like just over six hours. Yeah, yeah, no, he's, <laughs> he's solid, he's solid. Eh? He's a big solid, diesel, man. big diesel. Yeah, man. Anyway, should probably talk about you. That's probably what we're here to chat about, right? So um, where I thought we could start, I was thinking about like some of my earlier 
memories of you. And one that came to my head is, I don't know why, but one year, I think it was maybe year 13, I decided to do the running elective at school. And obviously you were doing the running elective as well. And I couldn't remember who the maths teacher was, young maths teacher. Oh, was, yeah, was, yeah. Um, what's his name? Um, it will come to mind, but carry on. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah, so he was coming second, you were coming first, and I was coming third. And he said to me, he's like, oh, man, you're pretty fit. Like, you did well. And, like, you had almost lapped me, I'm sure. Maybe you did lap me. I can't remember. You were just so far ahead. There's just, like, no chance in even trying <laughs> to catch you. And that was kind of my first um, in clean into your ability as an endurance athlete, I suppose. And is that where your journey into endurance kind of started? Yeah, I think like, um, you know, if we take it back to when we went to high school, you know, like um, I think in year 10 was when I did the transfer. It was when like, it was like when your group of mates like Hamish and oh, that's my brother. Uh, and you guys <laughs> were getting into like event racing and stuff with like Dean and whatnot. And mm-hmm. um, I kind of like, well, none of our family really ever did that stuff. And I was kind of getting a little bit more fitter for more like first level hockey and trying to get fitter for that sort of stuff and um and then I kind of fell into um Helen Dobbins group and I knew Helen from primary school because I went to school primary with uh with her kids and uh so I've known her for years but never really explored into the kind of adventure racing side and yeah like second second year of high school I think that's when it kind of really really opened up started getting fit started going to the, the Rotorua adventure racing stuff and you know, it was, it was those like Thursday after electives after school where we'd go and take a van over of like kids and we'd go and do those event races in Otorua, do like a six yeah. hour and then, you know, come home. I think the most important part was the, the stop off at Mac is the way home and then, <laughs> and then you carry yeah. on. But I think that was really kind of how I got into it. And then, uh, and then from there, you know, Helen was like, you should, um, you know, doing a lot of this running stuff, you should do duathlons and, so I started doing duathlons, running, biking, um, was doing all right. And then wanted to, well, I got told to, I should do a triathlon, but that's when kind of Kieran Coates came into the to the ballpark and he's like, ah, oh, like, you know, you're like, you're running real well and you're biking well. Um, you should do a try. And I'm like, man, I've never saw my life. So <laughs> he got, he got me to the pool and it was just a disaster, but nevertheless <laughs> went to, went to the nationals for Xterra, which is off-road triathlon. And, uh, qualified for worlds in maui and uh kind of just went from there really that was really kind of how it all panned out um was yeah. just uh doing event racing to exterior to then jumping onto the road because yeah exterior didn't have um the the whole olympic dream in it so i went to uh went to the road instead yeah i wanted to ask you so it's funny you bring up the swimming i wanted to ask you what were some of your biggest weaknesses when you first started out it sounds like it was swimming so what was that experience like starting out with your swimming like oh it's 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 pretty tough eh? like um i don't know it's like i never swam when i was a kid i, I feel like around Fakatani, you just don't have those like learn to swim schools or you just don't do it you'd rather just go to the wharf and you know, pop some manus and, and go yeah. with the boys out there. And it's just good fun right there and going down to like Olds, Olds Road and jumping <laughs> off the cliff. And like, you just don't yeah. swim. You just learn how to swim. You're essentially in a river. And then like, I think the biggest thing and I still struggle with today, you know, like I'm nearly eight years as a pro nearly. Um, and it's just like the feel of the water is a huge thing. Like people are like, you know, what's, what do you mean? Like the feel of the water. And it's a huge, like it's massive, like the whole, um um technical side of swimming is like is massive um like you can be as fit as you want you can be the fittest person in the world but swim fitness is just a different beast like you've just yeah like you know I'm one of the I feel like one of the strongest runners and bikers in triathlon but you get into the water and it just cripples you um yeah. but it's like it's such a technique feel and I feel like swimming as as a whole is the only probably sport that I feel that a ten year old can kick your ass in. Like <laughs> I'm not gonna turn up to a track meet or a bike race and see a ten year old kick my ass, but in swimming it's just it's purely just feel. Like you if you have yeah. the feel of the water, you can generate so much power and so the feel is just it's incredible. Once you get that feel, 
if it, it, swimming's amazing, but if you don't have that, it's 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 demoralizingly hard. Um, yeah. And I think only the last few months since I've um, gone to a new coach, I've been with the swim coach. So I've got a specific swim coach. I've been with him for two years now. And it's only now that I've actually started to really feel the water in some ways, like how the catch works, how you grab the water when you first um, essentially get into that first stroke. And there's all these little things like there was a period two months ago where I was swimming probably, I don't know, the last three years I've swum the worst I've ever swum before is because I was completely changing my biomechanical swim stroke. And essentially I had to swim slow before I had to swim fast. And it was just three months of just mentally just like going slower and slower. Um, And as, as a professional athlete, you're just like, you know, this is my job and I'm doing exactly the same hours in the pool. I'm exactly the same case in the pool, but I'm going to have a lot slower and mentally that is just like crippling. And then you just wake up one day and you get in the pool and you're just like, boom, this just happens. And it was pretty cool. And when, it, when once you got it and you understand that how that biomechanical change shifts, your whole body adapts and then you just start swimming. Like now I'm swimming probably three, four seconds per hundred quicker than I ever have, um, which is massive. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's just like, I think that's the, the most important part is uh, swimming and the the I think the technical aspect is huge. So such an interesting point you talk about there. It reminds me of um Mr. Wilds from school. I was going uh, through your Instagram today and I saw he was on that reel. That was so cool. Yeah. But um he taught us about this idea called speed versus accuracy. And the whole idea there is obviously if you go too fast, you're not accurate. So in that instance your technique is not gonna be any good versus like you're having to build that accuracy first and then slowly increase the the speed is that sort of what happened with your your swimming yeah i think so like uh, and everyone says and it's so just i know it's such a mind such a mind boggle for any professional athletes and you know it's like you have to swim slow to swim fast and it's like i don't know this makes zero sense to me um yeah. you just want to bang out and go hard every session and you're like oh if i go hard every session like surely that makes me go faster and then actually like it just more so cooks you and then you just start swimming like crap and then the feel goes away but if you really just slow things down and get the feel of the water and then things start making sense it's kind of like running like for me i'll run at the door and naturally i run relatively fast um and it just feels natural to me and when I look look at that, so then running, I'm oh, sorry. When I look at running to swimming, they're very similar. Where, like, I don't like when I'm at race pace, I'm not forcing the speed because once you start forcing speed when you're running, it changes your kind of your your shift of like biomechanical movement and becomes extremely inefficient. Um, and it's just you just go backwards essentially. It's like swimming, and then you go like swimming. You've got to to swim fast. You have to be as relaxed as possible, but still um, have like, uh, but still use the pa- have power. So yeah. it's like you've got to essentially like you've got to keep your hand your your hands got to be as like as relaxed as possible, and you're actually working it with your forearm. So mm. if your hands real like stiff, everything else is stiff. This is stiff, and then you just go nowhere, and then you start haymaker, and you're literally going nowhere. <laughs> just throwing then, hands. <laughs> yeah, literally throwing hands. <laughs> but if you slow everything down, keep your hands soft, um, and really get the glide in, and then once you get that glide in, like everything just makes sense. Like, it, and it's click for me. And same, that's the same with running. Like, once again, to like a flow state. Like, I'm running two forties for 5k and it just feels extremely easy that's um, ridiculous you know it's just <laughs> little things like that it's just crazy but when you get into like flow state it's it's, it's a very i think that's what it's, it's a driver you know it's getting always that flow state yeah how could you best describe that for people to understand what it might feel like for them to get into that state yeah like what are all the signals that are the lights are green that you're like cruising and you're in that flow what does that look yeah like? it's like well I, as a like, because you know, we're not, we're not as an athlete, like we're not like um, we're not always going full gas all the time. So, you know, when end of season, as we have three, four weeks off, and we do, you know, we, we essentially do completely nothing. Like we just do what we want to do for leisure. So, but we're going to keep it in check. So, if my coach says, hey, like you can do one thing a day, 
but it only can be like an hour long if it is purely for exercise. But if it's like a height, do what you want. If you just, you know, mentally, it's great. But like when you get back in to training, that first three weeks is terrible. And I understand like if you're a hobby jogger or a hobby rider or a swimmer or whatever, um, and you, you know, run clubs are massive now. And if you're just a person that goes out for a once a run once a week, I understand why people think running is so crap and yeah. it just feels like shit. Like Heart it is like 180 and you're like <laughs> yeah. gassed out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you're just going for an hour, 45 minute run. But I understand <laughs> what people mean when like you just running is just not pleasant, which it isn't if you're extremely unfit. But, you know, I'm getting up to, you know, 100K weeks when I'm running. And yeah. I would say 90% of that is, is really easy uh, for me personally. Um, and I get into the run sessions, is that's when that's when I go into the, the bigger zones. But, you know, if I come into a taper phase, which is, say, I say for example, if I train between 25 and 30 hours a week, I'm coming into a race. So that week I might only train 14 hours. So you, you get your body fresh. And then hopefully, you know, you've done the right things to get into – um that race so you can set race mode and you're obviously at your peak um but like in a race situation when you get into that flow state like yeah it's i think it's so hard to describe because it's like when you start running it just feels so effortless or when you start Mm -hmm. riding it just feels so effortless like some training days for example i could probably get into the flow state so you know like maybe on the on the swim, for example, I might swim the best I've ever swum in a, in a swim session, and I just feel amazing. But the next day, I swim like crap. Like it's just that is what it is. Um, same with the bike. Like I go into a session and I push. Uh, if I do like a, a five by seven minute effort workout, and I need to push specific power, which I look at, I'm like, wow, that's getting pretty close to my VO2 max session. Um, that's pretty hard but some days you just nail it and you're just like wow that was extremely easy and it just felt like you just push your put your pedal on the uh, put your power put your um pedal to the power and it just just feels so it easy it just goes yeah. like it just feels so in sync with everything and then same with running just like um some days i just get onto the track and you know i'm running what exactly what i want to run in a, in a race and it just feels absolutely effortless like it just feels you're like, man, that was, that was an, ex- like, that was a, that was a cool session. Like you're just pumped, like give yourself a little, you're there by the, you're, you're there on the track by yourself. And then you're just like, yeah, shit, that felt good. Give yourself a high five. You're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good work, but- <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that was, yeah, yeah. that was good. Like, you know, you, you finish a session, you're like, you know, I could have done another 5k at that, mm. but you don't because like you feel good and you're, you're, you know, you're happy with that and you don't want to overdo it. Um, that, yeah, I think for me personally, you know, it's fantastic winning races. It's it's great doing that. But I think what's a massive driver is just always trying to find that flow state. It's just like it's an incredible feeling. Like you might have a massive crowd watching you, but you just don't notice anyone. Like you might – everything just slows down and it's just like, yeah, like everything's quiet and it's just so – you're just so like focused, yeah. but you're not focused. You're just like – it's like a relaxed aura and you're just yeah. floating and it's like, this is amazing. And then you get to the last two K and then it starts really hurting and you're like, crap. <laughs> and you come to the present and you're like, Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, man, we're moving. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's just like, I love being in that state and I'm really lucky that um, the, the way that my coach trains me and he's known me for seven years, I think he knows how I can get into that zone. So there's days where I do real easy days and there's days where I think he knows in some ways that like, you know, Hayden's probably relatively fresh today. He could probably give it a good, good belting. Um, and then I normally, I, I look at the session like, man, I'm cooked. No, oh, I can't, I won't be able to do that today. But somehow I just like flick into a, a zone and boom, like into it. And yeah. like when you get into that zone, it's like, oh, it's a good time. You're humming. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's so good. What- what do you think are some of those um, external variables that you can control that allow you to get into that state? Because obviously there is, some days it's probably just going to be bad luck and you can't get into it. Training feels like you're just pushing shit uphill and it's like yeah. you're not getting into the groove. But what are those variables that you can control to at least optimize your chances of getting into 
a good session or that flow state? Yeah, I've, I've kind of like looked into it myself and like, you know, there's been days where I just, I still get the session done, but it was harder than it should have been kind of thing. Like that session should have been easy for me, but it was, you know, I kind of really struggled because I've got a lot of hours under my belt. I'm really, the body's really fatigued and it's great. You're still hitting the sessions, but it's like, ah, like I, I wish it was a little bit more easy than that. Like, and sometimes you just have to suffer in those, but I've kind of personally, I've gone into like, uh, I, I do see like a um, psych psychologist who's uh, actually nice. from Christchurch and he works with me really well. And uh, like one thing that really stood out to me, um, I feel like was, you know, elite athletes, if they don't do something right, or even just a person in general, if you don't do something right, you've act that's straight away. That's a failure. Like you get really, pissed off with yourself and that's a failure like you didn't do the session right you were five seconds off pace you know i failed that because i want to i always want to hit the times and if i don't hit the times it's it's a failure but you look you actually like counter reverse that and you just like look at it as a learning and that's what i've really kind of used and don't look too far ahead as well like just focus on that rep you know i look at a session i have eight twelve hundreds and i'm like wow like uh, probably by the sixth one I'm going to hurt, but I just really look at that and say, okay, like just do it one by one or just do a different counting method. Say just do two reps in a row. So two, four, six, eight, focus on the next, this two, focus on the next two. And then the last two, the second to last one's always going to be the hardest because the last one is the last one. You know, it's always, it's always the easiest I feel. Um, but just like always just try, I think everyone's different and you got to find what works for you. And like personally, the last few months, what, you know, I've been talking with this guy and uh, what really works for me is not overthinking it. And like, yeah, I'm very, uh, I guess um, I'm really hard on myself. Like if I'm not hitting sessions right, I get pissed off and start shouting. Just I'm the only one there, but I'm like, <laughs> like fuck. Like, yeah, just yeah. there like real, real like fired up and like really get really taught. I like pissed off. and. And that's when you start going even worse, but you just got to like take one or two seconds just to kind of go back, retake, and then just, just hit it again. And then if it didn't work, do the same thing. Just like take a breath, uh, take a couple extra seconds off that, uh, off that rest recovery and then just try and get into a rhythm and then just say, okay, might not be working today. Go into do that, still continue to do the session, but maybe. Don't think about the times, just think about the effort. What does the effort feel like? And that's what I felt like has really helped me a lot is if I'm really, really tired and I can't do the session, um, I might just take it back a bit. And I know what the effort feels like, what I should be touching, but it's obviously not the time at all, is just to kind of, yeah, take that time, relax, and then just kind of reset in some ways. Um, and I feel like that's really helped me a lot. And then sometimes it actually kicks me back into gear and puts me back onto the paces I need to go. So it's just taking the time because, you know, stress and upset energy is actually takes out, it zaps a lot out of you. So you can just like take one or two breaths and just say, Hey, like it's not your day today, but you can't have, you can't have a good day every day. Just reset and then, you know, try and go at it again. And I feel like that's really helped me this year. Man, that's really insightful. Yeah. It, um, reminds me of one of my favorite quotes and it goes something like as humans we're more sensitive to negativity than positivity yeah. like you might have 15 great sessions in a week but that one session where you were a bit behind pace oh, that's that would be the only one that you look back on be yeah like, mm. no, yep. but i didn't do that one good though yeah that's that happens to me all the time like i have periods when it was like boom like three weeks has been like unreal and then it finally that day finally comes where everything just unloads and you just have an absolute shitter and you're just like, that's the only one you remember. And it's like, yeah, man, I'm a terrible athlete. Yeah. <laughs> I can't you, do this. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I just like, that's what I do. I just like, okay, it's not working today. And then actually a good one on top of that also is like, um, once you're taking that time to kind of rethink the process is you just close your eyes and then, think uh of what you feel when you feel amazing so like if one day like i get into that flow state like what does that feel like what what are the colors you see 
what is what does this do for you you know like and then you try and picture that when you're having those bad days and that might work for you you know and i feel that's like worked yeah. for me a couple of times like yeah okay i might be one or two seconds off pace but i feel a lot better mentally and i can just get through the session because you do the first rep of like a, a long half an hour session and whenever you go hard half an hour always feels very hard like very long <laughs> yeah. and it's just like you know you just kind of yeah zone out and then you're just okay what does it feel like in that really good state and then just try and picture that state and then try and aim for that state and then just yeah. go for it and yeah seems to be working for me at the moment yeah i was um listening to this podcast and they were talking about visualization and they did brain scans of people doing the activity and visualizing doing the activity and the brain activity is like the same so the power yeah. of visualizing like your body can't distinguish the difference between thinking about doing the thing and actually doing the thing. Oh, so yes. it makes sense that putting yourself into that state, your body could start to assume that state. Yeah. It's like when you wake up and you don't even know, like for me, like you're just so tired and like a lot of people, you know, you've had a hard weekend or a hard week and you just like, I don't know, you just have a routine and half the time you don't even remember what you're doing, but you just do it anyway. Cause it's in yeah. such a routine. Cause you just, you've, you visualize it. You've memorized exactly what to do. And it's like me, like waking up, like I always go boom, straight to the coffee machine, like make yeah. a coffee. Like I know exactly what I need to do to wake up and feel good. And I'm like, and just do that repetitive, uh, repetitiveness in it. Yeah. And just kind of just flows, flows the day. And then you're like, yeah, this might be a hard day, but hey, we'll get over it. <laughs> yeah. And your, your coffees look good, by the way, bro. I like the oh, uh, post there, but yeah. I usually drink Americanos, but I'm like, no, I want to get into milky coffees. That yeah. so I'm, hard, bro. <laughs> I'm a flat white guy, but I can definitely have a, I'm, I'm, I do like a long black when I'm back in New Zealand because I trust, yeah. I trust the New Zealand barista. But... <laughs> the taste. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But I've, I've been, I usually drink oat milk. Just I don't know, just because I'm not intolerant or anything, but yeah, it's yeah. so much harder to steam. And then I was like, you know, I'm gonna yeah, try. Well, you, to need, you need to get you bro. need to get barista. You need to get barista oat yeah. milk. That's why. Because if you don't, it like separates and it's a disaster and it's like crap and it's yeah, yeah. It's not good. And then, and then I tried dairy milk and it was like so much easier. <laughs> yeah. like, Whoa, I almost feel like a barista now. <laughs> I know, right? Nice and silky and it looked good. Yeah, <laughs> when I first tried alternative milk, I didn't. I forgot, I forgot the whole, like, oh, like, what is this barista milk? Like, is this, this a fad? Like, come on. Yeah. It's like a year or more and you're trying to sell me this. And then <laughs> so I just got like the real cheap stuff and I'm like, okay, now I know why. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's something to do with like the amino acids or something. Yeah. Like yeah. Cause like the, I think in like cow milk and stuff, like, um, it's, it's thick, like it's, it stretches the milk where right. if you do, I think. And because it's just got all like the plasmas and all that sort of stuff in it from yeah. the like from the cow, but oat milks and almond milks and stuff they don't have that the plasmas and they can't stretch, yeah. so they try and stretch and nothing happens, and it just becomes when, um, a hot mess. When your triathlon uh, career's over, you can open up a cafe. Oh, I tell you what, it's on the cards, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, part of the plan. <laughs> part of the plan so, at some point. Yeah. So uh, obviously the Olympics is around the corner, and what I want to dive into with you is this being your second time around how does it feel going into this year versus your first time around is it a big difference in how you feel is it pretty much the same can you describe that a little bit yeah like i think there's two i think there's two big factors in tokyo and paris that are completely different um in the sense of where i am now and uh what covid did to the games yeah. so with tokyo i think we thought well, we were quite lucky because with tokyo you were, there were no spectators inside arenas but since we're triathlon you can't close the roads to public so we actually did still have solid crowds but mm-hmm. from people that come out and, and watch the race like we're, there was still a lot of people because japanese love sports so there was actually still a lot of people but from from being in Tokyo for to having like a you know like a pretty solid field um to then going to Paris is going to be like completely different like we went we did the test event which is essentially we go over the course a year before and we get to test out the course and it was a 8am start and yeah. like 
just standard European just and standard just French. They don't get up early. Like it's not an early <laughs> place. But this thing, they like over the whole course was like two to three people like thick. And this was just for oh. a test event. And because it's like, uh, it's quite funny because um, triathlon is actually huge in France. It's probably one of their top four sports. Mm-hmm. Um, so I race for a team in France, uh, Levan. So we have like a French division, these five races over the year. And um, you've got like um, eight or 12 different um, cities in Division 1 and there's Division 2. So you've got about, you know, every pretty much every um, town, city in France has a team. And um, so it's huge. Like, you know, you're getting professionals coming. You've got the Ironman World Champs in Nice. So it's got a rich triathlon culture. So, like, I know the Olympics is going to be like ridiculous um yeah. so that's a thing to to think about as well is just the crowd the atmosphere is going to be is going to be next level so mentally that's going to be quite hard to to to, to switch on because you know triathlon's not a huge spectator sport so you know i'm not like it's not like a super bowl or something where we just see big crowds every single day every single week or whatever yeah. or a pre- premier league game you know full crowds where I see it happens every four years. Like there might be some spots where we, there might be some stops in the around the world where we get really good crowds, like the UK and Leeds or um, Germany, normally really, really good. But like nothing compares to the Olympics. You've got an extra, you know, 10 million people just coming in and watching the race. And then the next thing I would say would be like the differences. I came into um, Tokyo where I was like, ah, oh, like this is awesome, great experience. All I want to do is get to the Olympics, so that was the dream. Um, and now I'm here, and I'm ranked kind of, you know, top Kiwi, sweet. Um, <laughs> and we had obviously the COVID stint, so that gave me an opportunity to really kind of double down on my swimming. And then I just got really fit running, and all this sort of stuff was kind of it was everything was happening well, and I wasn't racing a lot, so it gave me a lot more time to focus in on just purely training. And I. We and I know personally, like if all the stars aligned, which was which is extremely hard in a triathlon. Like there's so many uncontrollables that you can't control. And yeah, like as as I said, like if everything aligned, like I felt like I could have a good day and came off the bike on the front, and the legs were there, and the flow state uh, miraculously popped up, and, and except for the last fifteen hundred meters, because that really hurt. But uh, <laughs> yeah. I think yeah um that was kind of like yeah it was awesome like yeah i think it being not re- maybe a top 10 contender not a podium contender i didn't have a lot of pressure but coming into paris like it, once again it's completely different but in some ways it's the same like like i've I've ticked off that i got to olympics like i'm super satisfied with that like you know i can that was the one goal i wanted to do i got a medal which was like not even, like you know it's just a massive cherry on the top so you know, like if I have to retire tomorrow, like completely satisfied with that, which is cool. Uh, but like, I think Paris, I feel like I'm in like actually like the best position coming into it as a favorite because you've got the ex gold medalist who's racing Christian, who's kind of not in his form that he wants to be at the moment, but he's still a top contender and he's always going to be like one of the big favorites and a big name. And then Alex, um, who's, you know, always consistent. He's world number one at the moment. I'm world number two. And, Seems like um, you guys chop and change. So yeah. Much, and like, <laughs> so it's he, always you two. <laughs> yeah. And he won the race. He won the race a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it was a sprint finish. There was only a second in it. But I feel like that kind of puts even more pressure onto him to perform. And then there's the French there who actually race extremely well. You know, they're, they're potentially there to win the games or um, get that third spot if Alex and I come off the bike on the front. So they've got the pressure of the nation. And then I'm just here like, yeah, cool. Like, like I'm just here. <laughs> yeah, I'm just here in Andorra, just like <laughs> chilling out and training's going really great and like loving the process. And I just don't feel like I'd have any sort of like external pressures like yeah obviously there's always a pressure to perform and that's normally internal um but i just don't feel like i don't hit like it's i'm not losing any sleep currently which i feel like is a great place to be in Uh, i just feel like if i'll just do what i can uh on race day and as i said like triathlon is one of those ones it's extremely hard to control anything because you've got to go through the swim and that's very hard to control 
the bike, anything could happen on the bike. You've got punches, you've got crashes, whatever happens, you know, you can't control that. And the only thing you really can kind of control is what happens on the run. Uh, if you turn up on a good day, you can kind of control that. But once again, it's just, there's so many, you've got to, so many good, so many things have to go right to win a race and a triathlon. And um, I just, you just kind of hope it just happens every four years. Yeah, yeah. You've got to <laughs> put yourself forward in the best position possible. Yeah, and yeah. Just cross your fingers a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're just like, well, I'm in the front group now. I just hope no one crashes or, or I get a puncher, you know? It's like, oh. So. Yeah. Do, do you think that sort of mentality cruising into it? Because it sounds like you're super relaxed, man. Is that partly from the work you've been doing with your psychologist, do you think, and chunking things down and being more present and not getting overwhelmed by the things that are coming up, that kind of idea? Yeah, I think so. Like, not just like, because, you know, like I look at it now, like there's probably f- at least 50 days until race day, which is like not a lot. Mm. Um, and like the training has gone like extremely well. I couldn't, if I, if I got to get up, like if I Olympics was tomorrow and I had to look back and I, if I, there was anything I would change, I don't think I would change anything. Like the training's gone extremely well. The, the form is there um, and you, the process I'm just trusting. Um, and, and yeah, like I just think it's huge how many people just really, like I understand like it's a, it's a race. So it's every four years, but I think you just got to completely mind shift that. And you're just like, it's just another race. And it's really hard to think that it's just another race. But in, in reality, it is like you're not racing anyone different. You're racing the exact same guy you raced four weeks ago. Like, <laughs> yeah. like if it was one of those, if it was one of those competitions where, you know, it's like, for example, like the, the NBA, like you've got the, you know, you've got the different states. Um, yeah. And then you face each other at, in, in the two states face each other at the end um that that i feel like is different because you've never you never played against each other at all through the whole season where for us like i've raced these guys for four years i know exactly what i know exactly everyone in this whole field i know how they work i know how to beat them i know how to lose to them and you can kind of work around that where yeah i just think a lot of people do get caught up um in the hype of the olympics where i think you just got to like step back a bit and just relax yeah, that would be quite a, a big difference with your sport, the frequency at which you compete and especially against the same people too. Yeah. I could see how it's almost just like another race. Obviously, it's not. It's very significant. But yeah. given the frequency at which you race, I could see how it's almost just like another race that you're turning into. Yeah, like last year I raced every single guy that's got to go to the Olympics probably 10 times last year you know like Damn, that's wild yeah man. so and then like i've only raced them a couple of times this year but the times that i've yeah. raced them i know what form they're in so that's all i need to know but also i don't want to give my form away like yeah. the race a couple of weeks ago like probably um didn't show all my cards and that's kind of what you want to do you don't want to show everything a few weeks before because then you can go home do your homework and then try and do something to try and counteract what you did you know four weeks ago so it's like definitely like it's definitely like um um like a mental mental game out there um as much as it is physical like i don't feel like i train harder or better than anyone else that i race against but like mentally like it's such a different game like like some race when i first got into the the top tier of racing so we call it the world series and there's seven of them throughout the year when i first got in like i was performing really well at a world cup stage which is second tier uh, but i went into the world series you just don't you get into the race and get into the bar like a, into a good group but you just don't feel like you belong um and you just like you just feel like you just like rev your, your limit is just like at the limit and you're you just redlining a, it yeah and but way below what you can actually do and mm. once you get over that like mental lump like everything just opens up and you just have like that confidence and like more so think in a position that I'm in and I think Alex is as well as this my the guy that I always go toe to toe with. I feel like even though we're not we're not we might not be leading the race from the swim or on the bike at a certain point, we still have a massive control of the race. Um because I know I think a lot of people know that we're um yeah, still there and if we're we if we're in touch we can outrun them. Yeah. 
when, when it does come to those mental components of the sport, that's an interesting one, almost like touching on a bit of imposter syndrome or something. What, what are some of the other bigger mental challenges that you've encountered throughout your time, either micro ones, you know, specifically in a race or macro level ones, say, I don't know, when, when the, you're working on your swimming for those few years, but when it comes to the mental aspect of the sport, what are some of the biggest challenges you've had to overcome? Yeah, I think um, it's actually my, my manager always tells me about it and it's like, it's actually extreme. Like it's, it's very easy to get to the top, of you know world, world number one it's very easy to get there i feel but it's extremely hard to stay on the top and mm. i think like it's a really weird mental change when you start winning races at the top level and you're you know you're in the world number one or whatever and you go into a race and you just don't i don't know you just don't see yourself off the podium like you get into that sort of mental mental state and that's like hugely powerful like you come into a race and everyone's looking at you like, okay, Hayden's lined up here. We do we line around him or okay, like he's in the front group, like what do we do? Like he's just gonna outrun us, like or what the gets game over, we're just running for a bronze medal. That's then that's the mentality that others get into because you're you're in that race. And when you don't perform, you're just like, Wow, like what about you know, you just kind of spiral a little bit and you get really frustrated and you just you did everything you could and the power was perfect, but no one wanted to work with you. And that's the counter of being one of the big athletes in the races. And one of the better runners is you might be in the second group, 40 seconds down on the front group of 10 and everyone knows how I race and it's really aggressive. So I'm going to get on the bike and I'll work on that bike until I catch that front group. And everyone knows that. So they use that to their advantage, which is they'll just don't, they just won't help me. And Sometimes we just won't get there because they're like, well, at the end of the day, if we all make it to the front group, Hayden's going to outrun us again. Um, so these guys are just like, well, we're not going to help, but we know that Hayden's going to work his ass off to try and get to the front. And there's been a few races where that's happened where I haven't caught up to the front. And like I haven't, I've only just only just got into the top 10 and you're just like, oh, you know, four years ago, Hayden would have loved a top 10 in a world triathlon race and a series race. But now it's like, oh, that's a, it's an absolute fail. It's a disappointment. So I think it's great having those as well. Like you have those disappointments in racing, which then kind of makes you refocus and go back into training and, you know, put a little bit more like that extra little effort that you might need to really focus in and redial everything. Um, and I think that's the mental shift that really helps me. And you can see it on other athletes as well when they have, when they get their first sniff at a podium. And when they get there, when they learn how to win, and then they're yeah. like, oh, like, I know that they're not, tra they're not training any different. Like, old mate's got 20th in the last few years, and he's finally got a podium because everything went right for him. But he knows how to do that now. And he hasn't changed any of his training, but he's changed his mental mindset. And now he knows how to get to the front of the race. He knows where to position himself on the bike. And he knows how to run the race to hopefully get to the end of it and podium or win the race. And that's what took me a long time to do was um, I was getting a lot of thirds, um, seconds, thirds, seconds. And when I first got the win, I was like, it just, they just kept coming. Like once you hit it, it's like a water, it's like uh, when you crack a dam open, you know, yeah. it just explodes. And you then you just the start winning, gates. winning. Yeah, you just win, 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 win. And then when you get off the podium, you're just like, oh, like, this is a bit of a this is a bit of a downer. Like it sucks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and there was like a period two years ago where I hadn't been off the top. No, where I haven't been off the podium for about twenty five races. Wow. Um, and then I and then I got off and got ninth, and I'm like, oh, this is a disaster. Like you've <laughs> really like, got to wow. I yeah, yeah. twenty five times. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And you're just like, oh man, this sucks. Um, yeah. And then, but it, it just kind of puts you back a bit and you're just like, okay, like how do you overcome this? You gotta really you're just like, okay, your ninth isn't the end of the world. You know you're better than that. You just gotta refocus and dial back in. Um and just mm -hmm. go back to the next race. Cause a lot of people say like, oh you're as good as your last race, but you know, you just gotta not think of that and, and get back into it and um yeah, uh, don't be scared to get back racing and just have that confidence you had when you won that race, you know, five weeks ago instead of 
looking at that race when he came ninth two weeks ago, you know? Yeah, it, it sounds like it's almost a catch-22 to podium. It gives you the fuel and the the proof, yeah, I have the ability to do this. Yeah. But then your benchmark shifts where your benchmark yeah, yeah. is now <laughs> – third or second or podium or first even if you're winning yeah, so yeah it's like okay i can do it but then you're like oh i didn't do it i came fourth yeah oh. yeah it's like it's definitely a, what, what's happening coming into this olympics you know like oh man i was stoked to just get on the team for the tokyo team and now you're like well i'll be pretty pissed off if i don't win you know like and now like yeah the the, the goal post you know the, i think it's it's also really good like your goal your goal post shifts in life and You've always so you're always gonna have a different goal. Like, you know, when the Olympics for me, when my Olympic career is over, you know, I look to do long course stuff like Ironman. So it's going to Kona World Championships and, you know, different kind of goals and mindsets and different racing and stuff. And but you know, for now, like I'm still young, I have that fast twitch fiber and that explosive energy. So it's perfect for that Olympic distance where, yeah, like as I said, like, you know, you look back four years ago. And you're like, sweet, in the Olympic team. And now you're just like, uh, yeah, like, it'd be a pretty disappointing result if you're not on the podium. Like, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, that's yeah. A, a massive, that's a massive mind shift, you know? Yeah, you're participating versus yeah. like, getting top three. Yeah, Literally. Yeah. Like, here's your participation certificate. Literally, like, like oh, wow, yeah, so I'm, a, <laughs> I'm an Olympian. Like, it's like yeah. unreal. And then you're just yeah. like oh crap like i'm olympian but i didn't get a medal like yeah 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 like obviously uh, you want to go into a race and you know you're there to win a race but in in reality like there, there's a lot of people that step on that line and they're like i'd be so satisfied with a top 20 or a top 10 even a top 30 mm. um and then that you know that's just their goal that's just their goal post you know and that will shift in time and for me my goal post is for sure like winning the race and i think for sure like i'll be stoked with uh, with the podium but that's at the end of the day like it's always that gold medal and I think that goes back to to Tokyo you know like I was so stoked that I was on the podium and I knew the next guy was 50 seconds behind so there's no way I was unless I collapsed and fainted uh, <laughs> yeah. I was I was losing a medal so with a guy that won that was the second Olympics and he knew what it was like to to lose or to to not have a podium so he had that mental drive. We're like, this is this is mine. Like I'm taking this. Where Alex and I were like, oh, like we're stuck. We're, we're, we're got a podium. We're getting a podium here. We got a medal, and like we were actually fighting to get on our Olympic teams. And now we're kind of, you know, going for going for a medal. Like how good. And old mate yeah. Christian was just like, no, nah, I've been there before. Like I'm <laughs> not. I'm not pissing around. And that was yeah. the mind. I think that was the mind shift that broke us in the race. Uh, where now this time it's like, like it's on. Like. Mm-hmm ready to go yeah i remember being so surprised like because we were obviously watching that race and like on the edge of our seats there was something about his technique he just looked like he was like muscling his way oh he does something it's disgusting oh, yeah i was like no nah, this guy doesn't have it i'm like oh shit he's like yeah. he's going quick like he doesn't yeah. look like he should be going that quick no but he's no. like yeah I, I, don't, I obviously don't know much about triathlon or running specifically but he was just like muscling his way through it i don't know every, every triathlete's like man what just happened <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> two scrawny little, two scrawny, uh, two scrawny runners get outdone by, uh, by old Blumenthal. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but but I the big diesel, eh? <laughs> He's just so strong mentally as well. Just knows what he wants and mm. goes for it. Yeah, just yeah. super focused. Yeah, I don't know if you can speak to it too much, but how are the the course and the conditions this year gonna potentially differ from last time around? Yeah, it's hard. It's like it's hard to know because like Tokyo was fifty fifty because like like blah, like a lot of a lot of people did get sick after the race, but um, I think that was more from the heat because the water was so warm. It was like thirty one degrees. It was super hot. Oh, uh, where Paris, yeah, they had issues uh, for sure with the water quality. It's not a it's not a secret, um, and they're always keeping us updated. But um, I feel what they have in place um for us is you know they're going to get it as good as they can possibly get it and i think we're still going to race like there's, there's no where, doubt where about are you it. actually swimming ah uh, the sin you're, you're actually yeah. in the river yeah it's no Damn good right. yeah <laughs> what? but they've got these like <laughs> protocols so like we've got the what we had in tokyo to keep i guess the pollution away is these big yeah um these big boys and they've got like four layers thick of boys which stops yeah. the top end pollution um but they've also got sensors 
from 40k down the scent and they've got every kilometer down until the race so they can actually track the pollution uh when it when it's going to be in our swimming area so for example if it rains and they can they can track this pollution they can actually delay the start by 20 minutes and wait for that to flow past and once that flow past we're, we're good to go but there is if if the water quality isn't good i think we do have one or two days of um i guess like leeway, um, leeway yeah yeah so they're, they'll try and like i think i think every triathlete as well like we don't care like if we get sick we get sick like we just want a triathlon like yeah, just yeah, chuck yeah. us in there like we're gonna get sick probably um <laughs> sin hasn't been swimming for like 100 years like yeah that's a thing man. that's wild <laughs> like, that's well, so like i'm like i'm in there for 18 minutes like i don't care like i'm gonna get <laughs> sick like i just don't want the race like yeah, yeah it favors me for it to be a duathlon 100 percent, just a, just a run and a bike um, but I don't want to, I want to win the triathlon as a triathlon, not a duathlon, because yeah. I don't know, you just feel like a false sense of like victory. Not the like, same. Yeah. yeah. Like, yes, I won the Olympics. Like, that is like, unreal, but it was <laughs> the a duathlon. duathlon. <laughs> yeah, and then all yeah. the haters, all the keyboard warriors come out and oh, you only won it because it was a duathlon. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, at least yeah. if you get sick, you won't get sick till like maybe the next day or something. You right, won't be like exactly. spewing up on the bike. You'll be right. right exactly. Yeah. Like, I just feel sorry for the 10K swimmer guys because they've got to be in it for two hours. Oh. Bro, that is a long time to be It's a long river. time. It's yeah. like makes me think about like, I don't know, jumping in the Thames or something. Like we were in London a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I look in there, I'm just like, mm, yeah. you don't want to swim in there. I thought they would have done what they do at the Thames because it's actually a swimming area because we, oh. uh, we swim in Port Quay, so you know where the key is. Yeah. Um, there's, like a, there's like a section of water where it's actually beside the Thames, but it's not the Thames. It's, it's like a fresh... Oh like ravine of water um and it's perfectly fine to swim in like we've swimming it four times and never been sick um for racing and like they, i thought they would have done something like that like like block off one sector of the sin and then just like try and purify that section yeah. and it's then almost like a big swimming pool <laughs> yeah essentially yeah, yeah just one section yeah. where the, the river flow goes somewhere else and you just block off this section of water which i think i think they probably could have done and you just block the center of water, which could be 900 meters long or whatever. Um, mm. And then just try and filter that out and clean like that, purify that water. Like they do sometimes when we race in Montreal, there's like a, a pond we swim in and it's like a big pond, like it's solid. <laughs> But they like bomb it with chlorine because of like the duck the duck shit, <laughs> and like you're swimming, you just smell like chlorine and duck shit. Eh? It's no good. Yeah, that's a combo. But you know it's it. you know it's clean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like when we were in um, Copenhagen last year. That river there, man, looks so nice. It was the yeah. middle of winter, so people were doing cold plunges. But you can just tell that they have their yeah. water purification yeah. like down. It looks yeah, so good. it's like uh, and if you go to Switzerland and Zurich, they have like the big river there, and you can like walk three k up the the city, and then you can just swim down, and like you just go, like, you can go into your your little blow up buoy or whatever, and you just <laughs> float down. And people do it all the time, and because one of our exchange students that um that I was at in my, in my year, Gina, um, that was my first place I stayed at because I never been to Europe and I didn't know anyone in Europe and I was quite new to the circuit. So I was staying in Switzerland for like three months and she took me to the city and they're like, Oh yeah, people swim this all the time. And there was like hundreds of people just chilling out beside it and swimming. And it was like, it was pretty cool. Oh man, man. that's so cool. Yeah. That that actually, um, that's a nice little segue. I wanted to chat to you about your time that you spent away from New Zealand because you spend like the majority of your your time in Europe now what has it been like for you spending so much time away from friends and family yeah like I think the first few years was super hard um but I've like a really like you know I've got a I've had a girlfriend now for the last five years and and that kind of thing that really helped kind of cover that void of just being by yourself um Mm. but I've always been relatively independent um I think that's the way I've just grown up around like two older brothers and my dad passing away and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, like I feel like I've just been very independent or quite, quite some time now. And yeah, like the first year was always pretty hard, but I had like, um, had it, the only people I knew cause I was so new to the circuit and I wasn't really part of New Zealand high performance when I first came over here like six years ago. Um, so like this is, for example, like I stayed with Gina for like three, four months and, 
in uh, Switzerland, and then I actually stayed with Florian. You know, Florian. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I had him on the podcast. Yeah, I thought you had him yeah. on the podcast. So I stayed <laughs> we, with him. We were in, chatting about you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I stayed with him in Hamburg for like, yeah. oh, just on his couch in like oh, uni nice. halls in, in Germany for like three weeks. Uh, and that was really cool. So like I was just, you know, surfing on couches essentially through Europe because yeah. I had and no obviously money. obviously still training and stuff at that time. Yeah. And I had like, because I had oh, zero right. money and no like support or anything yeah. uh, other than from like, like local people. And um, and then obviously the results came and I started to race less and because, you know, the money was coming in and all that. And um, yeah, then I kind of, I kind of came to the realization that like whenever I'm home, I always try and really make the effort to go and see my mates. So like mm -hmm. catching up with uh, a lot of the boys over coffee or something is always like making sure I go out, you know, when everyone's home for Christmas, go for a beer with the boys because like, I know I just really enjoy seeing the lads because it's just, you don't talk about shop all the time. You just talk yeah. shit all the time. And it's great. And I really like that where, you know, like it's just part of, it's part of the job, but like, when you go to racing or you see like a, like a fan on the street, they want a photo with you. And then they, they just want to talk triathlon. It's like, Oh, like I do like triathlon, but like yeah. if I had to give it up tomorrow, like I, I know I would have something outside of the sport to do. Like it, triathlon's not my whole life. You know, I've got mm. things outside of it and that's why I really like coming home and, you know, just, you know, going out and playing cricket with, with my brother and, um, yeah. Just, just bowl you out. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then you're like, like, let's go for a run. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get him out there. But just like doing like just the, the, the little things I used to do at home, you know, just just things off triathlon, I think is like super important. Um, yeah. Because you know, it's like you become a workaholic, you know, like you train all day and you live and breathe it and you've you got to have some time off. So that's what I really enjoy. And when I got over to Europe, it was quite hard to distance myself from where you obviously are your mates, but you make new friends on the circuit <laughs> and people that are like-minded, but also like, like to have a life outside of the sport as well. And, but nothing beats coming home and like seeing the lads. Like I really, really enjoy that. And it's really nice. Mm -hmm. Um, and you just, you just got to keep reminding them like, don't worry boys. Like I haven't changed at all. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, still the same Hayden, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> just continue to give me shit because it's good. Uh, and I love it. Yeah. Um, but, um, but now I like I live in a beautiful place um, over in in Europe, a place called Andorra, which is like in the Pyrenees. It's between nice. France and Spain, and yeah. it's in the mountains. It's like a it's kind of essentially it's like a a Wanaka, um, Queenstown on steroids. That's um, so cool. That's really nice, and yeah, like looking to buy a house here and stuff. And I you know spend eight months of the year racing, and then try and come back to New Zealand um, for that kind of that Christmas period and just kind of get a little bit of sun, but obviously see friends and family is the most important thing. And then, yeah, go back over and yeah, you gotta, gotta make, gotta make money when the sun shines. So you gotta get back yeah, over there. Right. And race. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is it like coming from a, such a small town like Fakatani and now having achieved all the things you've achieved in, in Europe on the massive like Olympic stage, all of that kind of stuff. Do you ever reflect on that? Like, such a contrast you know a small town of like thirty thousand people or something and then competing on the biggest stage all the way on the other side of the world how, do, how does it feel to to be where you are now having come from a small town i love it a eh? like per capita Pakistani does well like yeah for olympic athletes like we've got like i don't know this in this olympics like probably four um a couple sevens athletes obviously really? lisa Damn. um yeah. But yeah, like I don't have a, you know, like I, I come back home and I kind of feel safe because like everyone knows you and they toot at you in a good way. So when you're on the bike, you don't feel like you're going to get run over because <laughs> yeah, they're not like out of the way. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's actually really hard to train because you just got to keep your hand up and wave at everyone. It's quite funny. Yeah. Um, and like, I don't, I, I obviously don't have a street named after me. At least it does, but obviously that's the goal. Right. Hey, you'll get there. It's <laughs> <laughs> just a street in Coastlands or something. Yeah, like exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's got one in all like, surely. No. Oh, damn. But uh, no, I love it, eh? Like, you know, like just like the little things, you know, like yeah, I don't expect it at all. Like I'm more than happy to pay for my pool fee to help the community, but they're just like, oh, I'm just walking, mate. Like, you're sweet. Like just little yeah, things yeah. like that, you know, and uh, it's really nice. Um, and then, yeah, just like walking around the streets and, Kids just want to have, you know, have a photo. Well, I think like that's the nicest thing in New Zealand is like 
is like in France when you're at like um like for example like I'm in, in a place called Antibes and it's a really big like sports community for cyclists and triathletes and like you get you're just at, in a cafe and you, there's like been numerous times where someone pulls you over and wants a photo or uh, wants a signature or something where in New Zealand it's like very like pulled back and relaxed you know uh you know yeah. everyone's like, people oh. probably almost wouldn't want to no exactly you know, they would look from a distance but like, oh is that yeah, yeah, yeah. Want to come like up. half the time I brought, Hamish laughs at me all the time because of <laughs> Ben's obviously in Melbourne but Hamish cracks yeah. up all the time like you just see this kid like you can see him just like staring into your soul and he's like frothing eh? and just doesn't know what yeah. to do and you're like oh you want a photo mate like just like go up to him and hey Hamish just like just cracks up because he's like fuck it's funny because you just go up to kid and say like, you want a photo <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you should be doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as long as you're yeah. not taking a photo of them, I guess. Why exactly? Weird, it's right? normally it's normally the, it's normally the mum that's like, oh, can I have a photo? Oh, my son wants a photo too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, my son wants a photo, but really, yeah, it's like, yeah, <laughs> trying to get in it. Yeah, but it's good fun. It's funny. Yeah, it's, but the funniest thing I think it was uh it was on the Pakistani community board. Um, yeah. Some person was was like, oh, we sh- um we should do like a mural of like. Fakatani locals that have done extremely well and like over the world and some lady like piped up and said oh we should put we'd do a mirror of like Lisa Carrington and this this and that and Hamish Wild and, <laughs> and Hamish Wild. <laughs> <laughs> he would have been so stoked. Uh, he's like, was, "Hey, I'm the local radio yeah, personality." Exactly. <laughs> he, he just chucked it into the group chat and just couldn't couldn't hold back. It's like yeah, how it should so be. Good man. That's so funny. <laughs> Well, one more thing, maybe pulling it back a little bit training related before we wrap up. When it comes to training for different formats, like different lengths of races and the different racing formats, like the super tri stuff and the Olympic stuff, and do, does your training actually change much or is it kind of the same or do you change it depending on what kind of racing you're doing? Yeah, like um, it dep- all depends on the, on the racing. Hey, like m- more or less everything's very similar. Um, unless you go into Ironman and then you don't work on threshold stuff because you don't really want to be in a threshold state in a seven hour race, you know? Um, but like super try, like we might do some specific sessions. So maybe we do like a, a run session, then run onto the bike because it's reverse. So super try, we do a triathlon, but it's a mini triathlon, which lasts for, we do like three rounds um, and they're 20 minutes long, more or less. Um, but we do it like in reverse orders. So we could do run, bike, swim, swim, run, bike, just all this sort of stuff. And it's all different. So there might be specific sessions that we just get the legs used to and the body used to like tossing around lactate in different areas. So when the very, our bodies are very used to swimming, having all the lactic and blood flow in our arms. And then we're very used to flushing that out and putting it back out into our legs because it's the bike but our bodies aren't very used to biking and then swimming because of a lap day is in our legs and it yeah. struggles to bring it back to the arm so yeah. there's like little sessions sometimes we like if i come into a super league season i change up a bit um but like the hours of training doesn't change it's just yeah. maybe one or two minute workouts that i will do because i go out you know every day and some days i might swim in the morning because it's a hard session um some days i know it's going to be a hard bike session so i normally cater for whatever session is going to be the hard session so if it's going to be a hard run session of course i'm going to do that first up because it's going to be hard and i want to be fresh uh if it's going to be a hard bike session um yeah i'll do the bike first if it's going to be a hard swim session if it's just going to be a completely easy day i normally like to do the thing that i don't like to do the most first so swimming and then whatever happens the other day happens and yeah, I will train maybe two or three times uh, a day. Uh, I don't do swim, bike, run every single day. It's maybe I do a long run one day and all those sort of stuff. So it completely changes. So as a track that we don't swim, bike, run every single day. There's a few times we only do one thing a day or we do double days or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so it does change. And then Olympic distance between – so sprint and Olympic. Sprint distance is 750-meter swimming. 20k bike 5k run double that distance is olympic distance so we do yeah. sprint in olympic and then double olympic is in a half ironman and half ironman is the max i'll go up to so sprint and olympic are very similar 
um, in training aspect. The swimming doesn't change, very similar. The biking doesn't really change at all. It's very similar. Um, but the run sometimes it will. So if I'm training for an Olympic distance, the run sessions might go for maybe one or two K longer. Um, then say if I'm really specifically training for a 5K, but mostly it's very, it's very similar. But if you go into an Ironman, like a half Ironman, if I train for that, which would be probably at the end of the year, um, I'll probably get on the time trial bike a bit more. So that changes a little bit. So I might get on the time trial bike. So there's two different bikes. There's a road bike, which I race in competition for drafting racing, so the Olympics. And then there's non-drafting, which is Ironman. So you get a different bike, which is a lot more aerodynamic. And things on that bike, you can't legally race in a drafting race. So oh, there's like specific USO, UCI, which is um, the International Bike Union. Um, yeah. is they have legal guide, uh, legal kind of um, rules to oblige of different bikes. So there's a road bike, which the guys say, I race. Uh, for drafting races and the guys that race in the Tour de France. So our bikes have to be a certain weight, um, the seat, blah, blah, it's all this sort of stuff. Seat can't be a certain right. um, distance but behind the crank, the, the pedals and all this sort of stuff. It's like all this sort of... Whoa, I like, didn't know it was so specific in terms yeah, of like yeah. the bike setup. Yeah, so the bike setup is relatively specific So because you can get extremely aero in bikes and uh, but they just want to make an even playing field. And then, but the TT bike is, yeah, like a whole different thing. Like it's a, uh, the bike looks completely different. You're more stretched on the bike. So you're more aerodynamic and kind of in, and there's no drafting. So there's like a 20 meter drafting. Um, oh, rule. is it like a rule that there's no drafting as well? Yeah. So you get like a five minute penalty if you're drafting, for example. So you're going to keep that 20 meters yeah. away. So um, that would be if you were to pass someone you're like not allowed to sit behind them for a certain period of exactly. time exactly you actually like once you get into the 20 meter zone you have to pass and then oh, okay. you have to make that pass within like one minute if you don't you get a penalty um oh. so there's those little things mm. uh and to i guess watch the ruling with that they have these like little chips on the back of your seat and they tell you whether you're within the the distance of 20, 20 meters, meters yeah. and then once you're in that 20 meters you pass and then it'll go green when you're out kind of thing anywho that's more more technology stuff um mm -hmm. but the training side i will probably won't run as say for example i won't run because it's a 21k run so it's t you know 10k longer i'll probably um do a lot more tempo sessions specific at that pace so i might do you know three by five k at a at a much slower pace at the pace i want to run which for me is extremely easy but it feels really unnatural for me to do that because it's even though it's like still fast like i'm used to running 250 pace in a race yeah. then i've got to back back up a little bit and run like a really awkward three minute and five uh 305 pace You're which is like very forcing it to go slow exactly yeah because yeah. if you overdo it you're just going to blow up but it's very hard to you know hold back but you have to because you know you've got you know an hour and eight minutes of running because yeah it's a long way yeah. um and then the biking yeah as i said like you just get on the tt bike a little bit more and you might do like a few longer rides but more or less it's most of the training under half iron man to super sprint is very similar because you're you're in the anaerobic capacity and you're in you're touching threshold quite often and you're working those anaerobic systems, so it's very similar. But then Ironman is very completely different. Like you can be an absolute like dog at like Olympic distance, but <laughs> when you come to like Ironman, you can just completely shit the bed because your metabolism is so different. Like your fat to carb burning is not designed for Ironman, so it takes a long time to train your metabolic system for an Ironman because ideally you want to burn fats instead of carbs because you can store more fats all that sort of stuff and yeah. that's when it comes becomes a lot more scientific and a lot more training specific and training in specific zones to teach your body to burn fats instead of carbs and that's when you start doing the shift to longer distance and it's very hard to go back to Olympic distance because you lose your fast switch fibers you learn you lose the the way to your body loses the way to burn carbs instead of fats um, and all this sort of stuff. So, so scientific to it. Eh? Yeah, I was yeah. in 
chatting to Matt Kerr, who's a elite level um, yeah, yeah. athlete from NZ, and he was saying how he exactly that the 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 burning of the fats, like consuming less carbohydrates, and he said he's gotten up to the point where he can do like a an eight hour ride, basically fasted, and he's he's fine. Obviously, he wouldn't do that in a race, but he's like worked up to the point where it's about changing the energy systems yeah. and getting the body used to the different food sources that fuel the race yeah exactly yeah so it's crazy how that all that stuff works but yeah there is definitely like i think from iron half ironman under is very not like very similar you just you just change one or two things in different sessions but ironman is mm. that's when it changes for sure like a big change yeah uh, something else actually i just thought uh, aside from triathlon like what do you get up to out outside of training and outside of the sport like what other hobbies have you got going yeah on? so i do like i i just love building stuff so i actually just have like side like projects or when i'm in new zealand like always do like side projects like building like doing boats and stuff uh at the moment i'm not allowed to do a lot of stuff because my coach my coach and stuff is like you need to sit down and you like like just Stop like burning just, so real, much just relax man <laughs> just, like, just relax bro <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so like currently just playing like playstation quite a lot um yeah. just getting off the feet but yeah like i love like even though it's still sports rated i really like getting on the mountain bike and like just going out and just yeah um getting lost in some ways and I definitely after the Olympics, like I live in Andorra and Andorra is very high key mountain 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 race. So mm. I'd love to do some like ultra running and just getting out there with the sticks and just going oh, on nice. an absolute like hustle and just getting lost. <laughs> yeah, that'd, be, that'd be so cool. Just getting lost and just not thinking about anything like I've got to hit this, got to hit this target, got to do this. Like I just love to get out there and get lost. It just be sick. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, fishing as well. Like, I need to actually get my license here because you can do fly fishing here. It's trout I, I and whatnot around. I was going to ask you if there was fishing in Andorra because that's like landlocked, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. but no, there's trout, good rivers. Yeah. There's good rivers. So, yeah, just that sort of stuff, you know. Just I know, just try and always keep my mind busy. So, like tinkering with stuff, I like to be a tinker. So, yeah, just so doing building anything. with with boats and fiberglass, not like timber. No, nah, no. Nah. So I was doing like like. I was I did like boat projects. I buy like old boats and just like you know re, like refurbish them and stuff and just have a bit of fun. Yeah, like so get bigger. Do, do they still um, float after you? Oh yeah, I mean, oh, just yeah, they Hamish would say don't. Hey, no, I'm selling them. That doesn't matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. But um, oh, man, that's yeah, so cool. that's that's. I just kind of yeah. I don't really have a specific hobby, but I just love tinkering. And if like for example, like after the Olympics, we'll be looking at buying a house here, but. I'm really keen to buy an old house and just do like a full, like you do the whole go through the Reno scenario. Yeah. Like there's a, there's two houses. There's one that the Reno's are done. It looks really nice, but there's one that's like, is in a good state, but like, is like from the eighties. Um, <laughs> and it's like really well built. Cause it's built out of like around here. You get like the whole like Chateau style. So you get like the real yeah. nice rock, rock built, and they'll be up for another 200 years. So but like it needs, cabin. yeah, it just needs a bit of work and like that, that, that kind of like, that gets me frothing, you know, I'm like, yo, that's going to be sick. Yeah, man, that's so sick. We were yeah. actually um planning on doing a snow trip to Andorra last winter. Oh, it just yeah. didn't end up working out. Like we ended up doing too much other travel, but um, yeah, yeah, I was looking into the Pyrenees, man. It looks so sick. Yeah, I love it. It's just Adventure 101 here. Eh? It's yeah. super safe and I just, yeah, just love it here. It's, it's good fun. Yeah, Still snow but, here too. Cold. Yeah, we're we're looking at maybe going to the um Dolomites potentially. Oh nice. Like that is like so high on the bucket list. But yeah, yeah potentially yeah. if we end up doing a snow trip, we might end up coming to Andorra. We'd nice. Well if out. the house is ready, I just come on in. <laughs> oh well if you're doing Got a beer for you. I, I don't know if uh, I'll just bring the tent. That's all good. Yeah, yeah fair enough. <laughs> no, be cold. No. Yeah, we'll be oh, and golf as well. Play a game of golf because oh. we've got a couple of, like pitch and putts here, so I play golf as well. Oh, sick! It was. I was actually chatting to Brad about it because I've been thinking oh, about you getting what, into Brad, the golf. Brad, bro. Brad, Brad, <laughs> you're you're in real estate though, so it's almost like it's business. Like you have to be. It is. Like, you kind of have. Golf, you have to be good at golf, yeah. Yeah. Well, you can't I mean, sell a house otherwise. Not at all. It's all done. Uh, like golf course. And it is, yeah. So you bought that house. Oh yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I'm <on> the 18th <laughs> old. <laughs> but we um, I haven't been yet. But we've got a real good driving range here in Manchester. It's got oh, like, all yeah. the, the lasers and all that stuff. Oh nice. And it was him. He was like, bro, just go and get some like a few lessons or something. So I'm, 
I'm considering it, eh? Yeah, because it seems like a lot to. of the boys boys play golf. Yeah, when you get back to New Zealand, like it's it's part of the it's part of the some ritual, so you probably have to. Yeah, it's like an obligation. Yeah, there's a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unlucky, <laughs> yeah. unlucky yeah, camps. Unlucky. <laughs> yeah. I'll be losing. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, man, Hayden, thanks so much for joining me today, bro. It's so good to to finally link up on the pod. I've been invested in your journey probably almost from the beginning. Like when you beat me in that um running elective, <laughs> I still haven't forgotten. <laughs> oh, mate, don't 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 you worry, mate. Everyone was uh, everyone was all envious on the um the the high school the high school Hollywood. Cam, oh man, you were you were you were you were bloody doing everything from Mister Kid Boy. Like I only got deputy, so I'm not on your level. Ooh. But, oh, oh, you know, nice, bro. I know <laughs> <laughs> you you were doing everything from the the first the first uh, the first ex rugby team, and then you're like, oh, let's go sick eleven hockey. Why not? The boys are playing. Oh yeah, that everything. Was a great year, actually. It was a great year. You guys had a funny <laughs> team. It was fantastic. That was so good. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, that, that was so much fun. But maybe if if I was head boy and you were deputy, if I make it to the Olympics now and beat you in the next Olympics, yeah, you've got me. I'm on winning it. You're well. having you're having that yeah. street name. You've got the yeah. you got the home street name. Yeah, yeah. My my fastest one k so far is three forty two. So I reckon I can do it. Give me another yeah. four years. Give me a couple of years. Just shred yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm about ninety kilos now, so it's probably a bit heavy. <laughs> <laughs> or right, pure muscle probably, though oh absolutely bro no fat <laughs> no fat <laughs> should probably wrap it up man thank you so much again it's been so nah, good to catch cool. up bro awesome no thanks for having me yeah no worries man my pleasure <laughs>